verse 8 it says by faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob the heirs with him of the same promise that's where we are today for this lesson and so uh I uh, just want to bring out something here real quick. If you go back to Genesis 12, where Abraham first receives his calling, Genesis chapter 12, let me read the first six verses there. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Boy, that sounds like a great promise, doesn't it? Awesome. I'm going to go see this land. I'm going to be able to see my family grow. We're going to inhabit the land. It's going to be our land. But well, we know that this, that's not what happens. <laughs> but it says, uh, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And in the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the uh, place of Sikkim, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. The title of the message this morning, or this afternoon, is, There are Canaanites in our land. <laughs> there are Canaanites in our land. This is the land Abram was promised. This is, this is going to be your land. I'm going to show you where that land is. And they get there, and as we saw in Hebrews... They're strangers and they're pilgrims in their land. And in case you didn't know, a few chapters later, look at chapter 15. There's still Canaanites in the land. Look at verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, this is chapter 15, verse 18, saying, Unto thy seed have I given thee this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. That's a lot of ites. <laughs> and, and you're familiar with the Bible, everybody in here, I'm sure. 600 years later, you get to the time of Joshua, and they're going into the land. And who's in the land? Canaanites, right? Are they talking about like 600 years later? Abraham... Is gone. He's off the scene. What happened to the promise? God said, I'm going to give you a land. You're going to inherit that land. Your seed's going to inherit that land. It's going to be yours. We know after Joshua, you read through the time of the judges. Guess what? They're fighting the Philistines and they're fighting all the, the Canaanites and the Hezites and the Parasites and the Jebusites and, and all those ites. Mosquito bites and all that stuff. And so they're, uh, they're still fighting them. You go into Kings, or Samuel, and 1 Kings, and, and who's, who's David fighting? The Philistines, and all that. So it's interesting to note that Abraham's seed never did inherit the land. I mean, be patient. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit more. But they didn't actually inherit the land. And let me just add this. They still haven't inherited the land fully, completely. They haven't got that promise. If they, if they had, then why, what, what's he talking about in Hebrews? Whenever he says that they went as strangers, seeking a city, you know, that's not built by hands. Seeking another city that, that, that is not the city that they were, ever, they were ever roaming around on. And so I don't believe that that land is going to be theirs into the millennium. All right? And that's whenever they'll get that land. But let me say this. Spiritually speaking... We are the seed of Abraham, are we not? Amen. And we are dwelling in the land, in a manner of speaking, 
that God has promised, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but God has promised for us to inherit, you know, under the leadership of Christ in the, in the kingdom. But right now, it's, it's our promised land. Right now, it's not our land. So guess who's in the land? The Canaanites, right? Guess who's in the land? The Jebusites and all, all the ites, they're in the land. So the question I want to ask this afternoon is this. So what do we do with the Canaanites that are in our land? Right? If this is our land promised to us, what do we do? Well, what did Abraham do? Number one, let me say this. Here's what we got to decide as Christians. Knowing that we're pilgrims and we're strangers in the land that is supposed to be ours, but it's not right now. Number one, here's what we got to do. We can't let them have the church. We can't let the Canaanites have the church. Let me explain. There were times when the children of Israel throughout the Bible, it did seem as though they possessed the land, right? There were times David's there. He's got tabernacles, right? By the way, Abraham and Isaac and all them dwelling in tabernacles. What are tabernacles? Those are temporary, aren't they? That's like a tent. You know, you just pick that thing up and move it whenever you need to move it. They're just dwelling in these tabernacles, in these tents, going through the land that God has promised to them. And they're just going as pilgrims and as strangers. Well, there, there, there does come some times where we see, you know, David still tabernacles, but David's saying, you know, I want to build a temple for, the God, for God. And he's got the Ark of the Covenant, and he's saying, you know, God's dwelling here among us. And so there were times where they had what seemed to be great success and seemed to be peace. And David himself, great wealth. He begins to have all the blessings, it seems like. That, you know, and he's probably thinking, hey, this is the promise. I'm the promised king. I'm going to be the king over Israel. You know, God has promised this. But guess what? It was only a temporary possession of the land. And it was only inside the walls with the threat of infiltration. Right? They never had the land completely. It was always, guard, they have to guard it. Always got people watching. Always waiting for people that wanted to take, take over and to inf infiltrate and to, uh, and, and to get them off guard so they can take the land. So constantly they're fighting, right? Interestingly enough, when David lets his guard down and he's comfortable and he has all the wealth and he says, yeah, look, this is great. Guess what happens? Falls into sin, you know, and then everything starts to fall apart. Later on, he seems to get some things back together. He, he prepares the way for his son. His son's going to build the temple. What happens to Solomon? Builds the temple. Oh, this is great. The land has peace. This is, we're in the promised land. We're at peace. We got the temple. Uh, people are traveling from miles away to see the great kingdom and to bring riches and all that kind of stuff. It seems like everything's going great. And then Solomon gets comfortable and he drops his guard. And what happens? He gets, he gets uh, seduced, basically, by, by all the... I don't know if you can blame the women. I think it was just him, right? And he, uh, he goes after all these strange women. And what happens? He begins sacrificing to their gods, and they begin uh, uh, coming together, and the children of Israel begin going after idols and all these pagan beliefs and, and, all, and falling into all this, all this terrible sin. And so it's been destroyed. So never do you see them actually possessing the land. And we understand that. We know that they're not going to have that land until Christ is actually the one ruling and reigning for a thousand years on it. But... This is what they went through. And the same is true with God's people today. All right. We can say, oh, man, look, we possess this. Right. When we're in our church uh, and we are all gathered together and we're saying God is our God. And, you know, he rules and reigns like we're we're in the kingdom. Right. We are kingdom people. That's like a really popular buzz <laughs> buzz phrase. Everyone, We're children of the kingdom and all this kind of stuff. But guess what? It's only within our walls, it's only temporary, and it's with the threat of infiltrators and people wanting to stop the work of the Lord. And to stop, why? Because we're just pilgrims and strangers in this land. You know, we don't possess this. God, God's not the God of this world. Now, that surprises some people to hear you say that because you say, well, yeah, he's the God of the... No, look, he is the Lord and he is the God. He is the God. You know, there is no other... But 
temporarily, at this time, the God of this world is Satan. The Bible makes that clear. And so we are strangers and pilgrims in this land, and it's promised to us, but we don't possess it right now. Now, the, uh, the threat of infiltrators and the threat of people, uh, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm in good company here. I'm actually not one that's really prone to the conspiracy theories and, and all this kind of stuff. That's just not usually me, and, 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 and I'm not, not one like that. But, but look, you would have to be blind as a Christian not to realize that there's an agenda out there Amen. to corrupt the church, to take away the rights of the church, to stop us from being able to preach boldly what needs to be preached and to tell people that they're, they're wrong for living the way they're living. And they want everything that they can do to stop us from being able to do that. Right? And for some reason, why do so many uh, atheists and, and uh, sodomites and everything, why are they always targeting churches? And I'm telling you, I get emails all the time. I get all kinds of... Uh, of hate mail and stuff. It's like, what did I do? <laughs> you know, what have I? What kind of a problem have I caused? Nothing. But they hate God, right. and if they hate God, what's Jesus say? They're going to hate you. Right. And so there's a. We are strangers and pilgrims. Don't get so comfortable thinking that oh, this is our land. You know. Now there's a group of people out there that believe like we we uh, were supposed to take the kingdom by force. They don't believe in a literal thousand-year reign of Christ. They believe that uh, it would be like all millennialism. They believe that basically uh, the millennium is symbolic, and actually we're in the millennium, and so we're supposed to be like converting people. That was like the early Catholic church, right, thinking that they could take over and uh, convert people by the sword, basically, and, and usher in the kingdom of God. Didn't happen. <laughs> Never happened. In fact, they ended up persecuting the ones that truly were believers, <laughs> And, uh, and so it just, uh, uh, they, so, so let me get to this. All right. So think about the condition of our world right now. <coughs> I don't keep up with politics very well, right? I don't know who does. Anybody keep up with politics? Okay. I'm going to show you how badly I don't keep up with politics. I don't even know how to pronounce this guy's name. Beto is all I know. What's his last name? Anybody know? O'Rourke. Okay. I wrote that down, but I didn't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> so Beto O'Rourke apparently dropped out of the the race, right? So, yeah, I praise the Lord for that. But guess what? Are we really so blind to think that he's like the only one that wants the things that he wanted? <laughs> we know good and well that uh, every liberal out there that's running wants the same things he wanted, right? He, they want to take away the guns. They want to, like, uh, make everybody comply with the government and everything that the government, you know, wants them to do, they have to do it. And it's scary. If you have children, you know, nowadays, it's really scary. Like, you know, I talked about this here recently in one of the, uh, one of the messages. Like, when your child is born, you know, if, if, you're, if it's born in the hospital and they take your baby away, you don't know what's going on. And it's scary. Like, are, what are they shooting my baby up with? <laughs> All this kind of stuff. Again, I'm not big on conspiracy theories, but you'd have to be blind not to be, like, a little on the edge thinking, well, what's going on? And if you read the Bible... You don't have to think it's a conspiracy theory. We know what's going to happen. We know where things are going to get in the world. We've read the back of the book, and we know God's word is true. And so we know what's going to happen. But uh, why are they pushing to legalize abortion? That's the most wicked thing, you know. And you have Christians, so-called Christians, trying to even defend it and make it sound like it's not really that bad, right? And, and so they're trying to legalize abortion to the point where, you know, 10 years ago, you know, it would have seemed pretty radical, whereas now the things that they're saying and the things that they're trying to lobby for and everything, you know, we've almost become desensitized to it because there's so much out there that it's just like, oh, well, you know, we, it's not a surprise. We knew that they were going to do that. Yeah, but back up and you see how it's just devolving, you know, and getting worse and worse. And so you see them with trying to uh, legalize abortion and, and uh, they're trying to make it e everything they can to make it illegal for us to say anything against sodomites or say anything against uh, uh, trans, uh, transgender or whatever. I, I, I don't know. I, I was trying to uh, get a hold of our friend uh, uh, Joshua Gander because, you know, you hear things on the news or somebody shares something and you don't know if it's true or not. But I know that Canada 
is like a little bit ahead of us on like how, how bad things are and what you can, can and can't say. And, uh, and I had heard somebody say something about like you can't misgender somebody now. And there was some rumor going around that if you do, you can be thrown in jail. I don't know if that's true, but, uh, but to some degree, I mean, you just can't, you can't accidentally call somebody the wrong gender without the threat of being <laughs> in trouble. And you look, as a Christian, being a stranger and a pilgrim in this world, you look at that and think, what, where am I? <laughs> What's going on here, right? And, uh, and so <clears throat> they're trying to do all this. So here is a, I know he's out of the race, and I know I'm behind the times and everything, but so here was a, a little piece of an article I read. At a CNN uh, town hall meeting, this Beto guy was asked if he believed that religious institutions like colleges, churches, charities should lose their tax-exempt status if they oppose same-sex marriage. Yes, said O'Rourke. Uh, an answer met with raucous applause and loud cheers from the Democratic crowd. There can be no reward, no benefit, no tax break for anyone or in any institution, any organization in America that denies the full human rights and the full civil rights of every single one of us. And everybody applauds and, and, and gets all happy. Well, well, why is that? You know, because they're, they're of... The, of their God, Satan, right? And they're, they're not, we're not of the same, same world. Like, I don't understand. I can't reason with people that actually think uh, some, some of these ways. I, like, I don't understand it. Like, I cannot, uh, I can't sympathize with them because I don't understand it. All right, but there, there's these huge movements, huge agendas out there to make sure that the Christians are silenced uh, where they can't say these kinds of things. Now, we believe and every Baptist has believed all, you know, all back throughout Baptist history in separation of church and state. Separation of church and state isn't just something that's in the Constitution that we need to fight to keep the Constitution because we love the Constitution or whatever. No, that's actually something that's in the Bible. All right? So let's look at a couple things that the Bible has to say about that. Matthew 22. Now I know that as long as we're in this world... Uh, we're supposed to, as much as possible, comply with the laws of the, of the land and be peaceable uh, with all men as much as lies within us. And I am, by the way, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating like civil war, right, rise up against the government. I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, Matthew 22, look at verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. I mean, the whole time Jesus is, and think about that. Jesus is, is standing in front of you. I, I can't imagine that you didn't just feel a presence, you know, a godliness presence whenever you were around Jesus. And then to watch him just love people, watch them heal people that are diseased and perform all these miracles and still be so hardened and so callous that they would treat him, try to trip him up, try to catch him and, and entangle him or whatever. And they went and they tried to entangle him in his talk and they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Master, we know that thou art true, liars, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, uh, for thou regardest uh, not the person of men. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is, the law, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. See how he made this clear distinction. Like, you can have the money. You can have whatever. You know, Jesus cared so much about money that he put Judas in charge of the bag. <laughs> he doesn't care. He can pull money out of a fish's mouth. <laughs> he doesn't care. Take the money if you want the money. You want to tax me? Take the. You say, oh well, we're going to take away your tax exempt status if you say so. Take away my tax exempt status. I don't care. <laughs> What's that going to hurt me? Right? You know, uh, yeah, somebody come to church and say, well, if you preach on this, I'm not going to tithe anymore. 
Well, just leave. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want you giving money if you're if you're if you're that way. So, anyway, God controls all that. He doesn't care about those types of things. He said, "Give unto Caesar those things that are Caesar's, and give unto God the things that are God's." All right. He made a clear distinction. Acts 5, uh, 29 says uh, this. P then Peter and the apostles answered and said, "This is after they were told not to preach the gospel." Now, you got a government official saying, don't preach the gospel anymore. Beat them, send them on their way, that kind of stuff. Next thing you know, what are they doing? Preaching the gospel. And he says, uh, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, I try to obey the ordinances. You know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, when we're out knocking on doors, if it says no soliciting, I'm probably going to knock it anyway. Right, but I try to not cause trouble. Certainly, we don't want to start fights with people uh, like we talked about last week. Right, we're uninvited guests. We're knocking on their door, trying to share with them the love of Jesus. We're not trying to start a fight with them or anything. So, so we don't want to cause any trouble. But look, we want to give everybody the gospel. And if the government tries to shut that down, right, we still have the Great Commission. We still have the commandment of the Lord to go ye into the world and preach the gospel. And so we've got to do uh, what God tells us to do. Again, not trying to cause problems or be a troublemaker or anything like that. Uh, but we are just obeying God rather than man. All right. So we're in this land, in this world, and we've got a group of people, right, uh, who are pretty much running the land. And then you've got a group of people that are pilgrims and strangers in the land. Now, I'm not against, I'm not against, you know, voting to get the, uh, your local laws, you know. I mean, obviously, we got to live in this land, and we got to be able to worship God and, 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 and try to, the best that we know how, live peaceably with all men, like I said. So, I'm not against those kinds of things, but we have to realize that we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And we can't get so entangled with the things of this world that we forget why we're even here and how long we're here. Very short time, right? And so we cannot get off, uh, uh, lose our focus on that. Okay, so, so the question then was, you know, what do we do with the Canaanites that are in the land? Number one, well we, well, we don't let them have the church. Okay, we don't let them have the church. The church is supposed to be the place where we can be safe. Our children can be safe. Uh, we can safely worship the Lord, you know. We need to protect. We got the walls. We got the, you know, this is kind of like uh, the picture of Israel. You know, they might not have really owned the land that God had promised them completely, but they still, you know, did the best they could and they had their protection, but they were always on guard. And we've got to do that in our, in our church. And this is why, uh, although obviously we invite folks to church, obviously we want them to come. And if, even if they don't take the gospel out there, we want them to be able to come where they can inquire into the things of the Lord and find out what the Bible says and all that. But we've got to be on our guard that we don't just invite everybody in with everybody kind of lifestyle and do whatever they want without some regards to the decent, decent, uh, decency and order that God would have us to keep and maintain inside the church. All right, so, so we want to be careful not to be some kind of a, a cult or something like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying keep the church safe. This is where we want to be able to have a refuge, right? The world is out there. We understand that. But inside here, this is the house of God, right? When we meet together. So <clears throat> number one is we can't let them have the church. Number two, we've got, when we're outside the walls, right, we've got to either convert them or let them be. Convert them or let them be. We understand this. Our battle, our warfare isn't a physical one, okay? Ephesians uh, for uh, Ephesians 6 12 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual uh, wickedness in high places okay our our battle we're not going to take up arms and go out there and try to uh, you know get anybody to convert <laughs> you know it's, that's that's not what we're doing our our job is on this earth our battle is a spiritual warfare right Number one, we're arming ourselves spiritually uh, with, with that which would keep us from the fiery darts of Satan, right? We're putting on the helmet of salvation and the shield of faith and all that kind of stuff. And we're maintaining uh, a pr protection in that way. Number two, we're on the offensive and we're going out there and we're trying to reach them and convert them right to Christ so they can be part of us. 
Look at uh, 1 John chapter 2. <clears throat> this warfare will keep on, this spiritual warfare will keep on going until Christ comes. And in the meantime, the Bible makes it very, very clear that there is an us and there is a them. There is an us and there is a them. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. <clears throat> Well, let's just start with 15. That's a good place to start. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of, the fa uh, the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists, wherefore we know uh, that is the last time. Look at this. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. Okay, you see they and us, very clearly, this clear distinction. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the, whole, from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Look at uh, uh, chapter 4 now. 1 John 4 and verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. Uh, he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You see this continuing just us and them. Us and them. We are of God. They are not of God. They are of the world. They are of their father, the, uh, the devil. And so there's this, there's this clear understanding in Scripture that there's an us and a them. And if you talk to the average person, even of those who claim to be Christians, they will say, well, we're all just children of God, right? And there's a little good in everybody. And, and if we all just, you know, would just try and, and we'll do our best and we'll, you know, uh, I was listening to, in Sunday school, I'm doing a series on Catholicism. And so I've been doing, a, I've been listening to a lot of uh, priests try to explain why they believe what they believe because they're all on the defensive because they know they've got some weird beliefs <laughs> that are contrary to scripture right so they're very on the defensive like trying to explain well that's not really what it means and so I've been listening to a lot of that <clears throat> and uh, and he was saying you know because one of the questions is you know well can I marry somebody that's not a Catholic or if somebody's not a Catholic are they going to go to hell and and, you know, maybe there was a time where the Catholics would say, oh, yeah, definitely. If they're not Catholic, if they don't do these things, you know, there's four things you got to do, right? There's like the Eucharist, right? And, uh, and there's the, bap the baptism, and then there's the confession, I think, like that, and then there's faith, right? Just throw that faith in there, right? <laughs> there's four things that they got to do. And they say, no, we believe just like you. No, they <laughs> don't. Okay, but, uh, but anyway, so now what they'll say is, well, we believe that, you know, like the thief on the cross, we've all used that before. Like, what about the thief on the cross? He wasn't baptized. He didn't take the Eucharist, right? But the thief on the cross calls out, and they said, well, God knows his heart, and if he's really good, he just does good according to what he knows, then we're just hoping God will show grace. And so they feel like that about everybody. Well, look, that's, how, that's what everybody thinks. Everybody thinks, well, we'll wait and see whenever we get to heaven, and hopefully God will have grace on me, right? And so we know that the whole world is confused, and they're, and, and they're either blinded, or they're reprobate, okay? So we got to either convert them or let them be. Let them go their way, right? It's like oil, oil and water. They just don't mix. And so uh, there's clear teaching that there's a us and there's a them. Uh, the Bible says uh, very clearly that we're pilgrims and, str and strangers on this earth. Number three is this. What are we supposed to do with the Canaanites that are in our land? All right, well, number one. No, don't let them have the church. Number two, either convert them or let them be. Number three, we keep sojourning. We just keep sojourning. We keep on picking up the tent, moving it whenever we got to uh, move it, and we keep on uh, dwelling in tents like Abraham did with Isaac and and uh, and all. And so uh, we ought to we ought to while we're sojourning 
keep our eyes on Jesus. Be alert, right? Be Try to protect the house of God and, all, and keep our eyes on Jesus and keep doing what we're called to do. Uh, here's some things about us as sojourners and foreigners in the land. If we're foreigners in the land, don't you think we ought to act a little bit different than the rest of the world? Right? And we're not of this world. It should be obvious that we're not of this world. I'm not talking about act strange. When I say stranger, I don't mean like a weirdo, like a, the Bible says about a peculiar people. Well, that doesn't mean like... <laughs> I mean, there's some of us that are kind of strange, but I'm just saying, like, like it's just saying that you're foreign, you know. Uh, if somebody from another country comes in and, and, you know, and they don't say all the words quite right, they don't dress right, they, don't, they might smell a little different or whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean they're just weird. I mean, you might think that they are, but I'm just saying, ultimately, what you're looking at, you're saying, hey, that's a foreigner. That's different. He's not of us, right? Uh, anyway, so... <clears throat> We ought to, as Christians, talk and act a little foreign than the rest of the world. We ought to, as Christians, keep away from certain places and certain activities that the world does, yeah. right? It's because we're not of this world. We, are, we ought to do this, this. Here's what Jesus said. By this shall all men know ye are my disciples if, say it, ye have love one for another, right? We ought to love the brethren, you know? There shouldn't be disputing and hatred and, and, uh, and uh, fighting and stuff inside the church, right? We should be on the same side. The Bible talks about uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians 6. And he just got done talking about, you know, somebody that was living like the world and they were puffed up and they weren't repenting of that and they were... Uh, living in this gross fornication, and he says, hey, we need to, you know, get this person out and, and, until they repent and come back. And, and then, anyway, that's another story. But then he's talking about judging, you know, and I know that the world likes to throw out Matthew 7 and say, don't judge, but take them to 1 Corinthians, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 6. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 6. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. He's saying how weird it is that you would take up your matters among Christian brothers and take it before the, the courts of the world, unbelievers, and let them decide how, thing, how, how, how to settle the matter. You understand how that doesn't make sense? Because we're foreigners. We are pilgrims. We're sojourners. And so we, inside the church, try to handle our own affairs the best we know how. Again, I know we are still subject to some laws and stuff. I'm not saying, like, just totally be, you know, anar <laughs> anarchist or something like that. But in the church, right, we should know how to judge according to the Bible, the things of God. This is our, our, our govern, governing <laughs> book here, our law book. And we can govern according to that. We can look at each other, rebuke somebody when they need to be rebuked, you know, tell them, speaking the truth in love. We can help somebody out. We can, you know, uh, uh, correct somebody. Uh, typically, if you follow the biblical model, right, somebody's living in sin, and you go to them and you talk to them about that, if, they, if they're your brother in Christ and they still have a problem with that, what's Jesus say? Bring somebody else with you. You do that. Now you got two of you and you're standing before your brethren. He's probably going to repent by that point, don't you think? Like he's been called out, been caught doing whatever he's doing, and two people are going to him. Then the Bible says, okay, if they don't hear that, take it before the church, right? You would think by that point, if it's your brother in Christ, they would say, okay, man, I got to get right. <laughs> you got me, and I got to live right, and I want to. And then we're supposed to forgive them if they're truly sorry and they're trying to, trying to do right. But... Uh, I lost, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so yeah, so, so we, we should be able to, to do that. And then it says this, if they don't hear the church, 
Let them be as a heathen and a publican, right? Let them be like, you know, you're saying, well, I don't even think you're of us, right? Because you, you understand? Because you should be acting like us if, if, you're, uh, if you're of us, okay? So 1 Corinthians 6, I think, is, is great. You know, Paul is really making it clear, like, you know, we have... Uh, matters that we judge among ourselves inside the church according to the, according to the Word of God. <clears throat> All right, look at uh, 1 Peter 4. So then you say, well, what about those people that are converted, right? Because... Most of us, you know, most of us in here probably weren't just raised from our infancy. I know there's some of them that some of you guys have raised from our infancy as children of God. Like you're saved at a really young age. You never really were out in the world. Most of us had our time in the world. Right. And we were we come to the Lord and look what it says in the first Peter four, four. Or let's back up a little bit. Let me see here. Look at verse three for the time pass of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Isn't that something? <laughs> they look at your life and say, wait a minute, I thought you were one of us. Not anymore. <laughs> Well, I don't understand. Why aren't you running with us and doing the things that you used to do? Because I'm of a different people group now, <laughs> right? I'm of a different people group. I'm part of this church group. Oh, you're some kind of radical. Yep, call me what you want to call me, right? <laughs> but I am now part of the us and not the them. And so it says, man, people don't understand that. And then they, uh, they think it's strange, you know, that you don't run with them and do the things that you used to do. But guess what you keep doing? You keep sojourning. You keep looking ahead. You keep looking for a city, right, that has been promised to you because it's coming. Stay tuned. Christ is coming, and he will rule and reign on this earth, and we will rule with him. Lord, I ask for your blessings on uh, this, uh, this church here, and, and I pray, Lord, that you'll help each of us to consider our own lives. I know we have this flesh, and I know we have this bend towards towards uh, the things of this world and lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and the pride of life and all that's in the world, Lord. But help us remind ourselves and remember that we're just pilgrims and sojourners in this land. We're in this world, but not of this world, Lord. And I pray you help us uh, to live as such, to uh, love one another and encourage one another and be friends and, and, uh, and, and work together as a team. And also stay separated from the things that would uh, uh, mar us and, uh, and, and spot our, our garments. And Lord, we know that in Christ we're, uh, we're secure no matter what we do on this earth. But I pray you help us to live clean lives so we might be more effective. We might honor, be more honoring to you and, uh, and even to receive re rewards when you return to give to every man according to his works. Lord, uh, bless the rest of this time now. In Jesus' name, amen.